Um, I'm talking about uh, yeah, a new, well, probabilistic object which arises in a different scaling regime in seed bank models. And uh, I find it interesting from a mathematical point of view, but I would also be very interested to get feedback from the biology uh, community about its re possible relevance or uh, applicability. I would also like to point out that this is really a, a joint work with Bjarki Elden, Adrian Gonzalez, Casanova, Noemi Kurt, and Maite Wilke Beringuer. Arian is here in the audience. Unfortunately, the other uh, co authors are not here. And I would also like to say that uh, we started to think about seed bank models uh, about four years ago when Arian came from Mexico and uh, yeah, started to do a PhD with me. And uh, it has been a great pleasure to develop these ideas with you over the last years. Yeah, um, Aurelien has already given a, a great introduction <laughs> to seed bank models. Uh, with a more biological, slightly more biological focus, perhaps, and he's of course uh, has a much greater, far greater expertise in this than I have. So I can uh, review just a few uh, points. So a variety of species, not only plants but also many microbial species, produce seeds or dormant forms, which introduce an age structure into populations or seed banks into population genetic models and. Um, so they are generally believed to act as a buffer against other evolutionary forces, such as uh, random genetic drift and uh, selection, and uh, also play the role of a bad hatching strategy to overcome like, temporarily unfor unfavorable environmental conditions. And uh, as Aurelian has already pointed out, their presence typically leads to a significantly increased genetic variability, and uh, also classical mechanisms such as fixation or extinction become more complex, uh, because genetic types cannot disappear from the active population completely in principle by returning later due to the germination of seeds or activation of uh, dormant forms. Um, yeah, so I will uh, put a special interest on dormancy in microbial populations um, as opposed to plants in uh, Aurelien's talk. And uh, I also refer to Lennon and Jones who have written a nice overview paper in 2011. And I just want to collect some of the findings. So many microbial species exhibit or produce dormant forms. And a dormant form here is a state uh, of, uh, well, it's an individual in a state of low or even almost essentially vanishing metabolic activity of an individual, which is reversible. So uh, an individual, an inactive individual can act, become active again after a while. And uh, this can, I mean, these dormancy periods can uh, last for extended amounts of time. So they can be short-lived, a few generations, as in the case of plants, but uh, also many decades or centuries in the case of bacteria, and there are also reports about bacteria who have been resuscitated after thousands and even millions of years. So uh, this uh, dormancy can uh, be well, really an extended period of time. Again, these dormant microorganisms generate a seed bank, uh, which comprises all these inactive individuals which are capable of being resuscitated. And, um, well, there are many uh, mechanisms to trigger dormancy. So, for example, changes in the environment. And this is uh, discussed, many of these uh, mechanisms are discussed in this paper by Lennon and Jones. But it seems that they may also spontaneously switch between the two states. And, uh, well, it's a question, what is the evolutionary advantage of this? But, uh, of course, this is one way to, I mean, uh, keep variability and uh, have this bad hatching. And, in fact, if you look at microorganisms, it seems that a large fraction of the present microorganisms in nature seem to be metabolically inactive at the moment. So here is data from Lennon and Jones, and they have been counting cells. For example, in the human gut, you find about 25%, well, a little bit more than 20% of the microbes in a dormant state. In soil, it can be about 80%, marine water, fresh water, something around 50%. So there seems to be a large seed bank roughly comparable in size to the active population. Well, that is yeah, maybe the finding. So as, also as opposed to plants where the seed bank can be much bigger. Uh, then, of course, there are many empirical studies in, uh, 
on seed banks and several theoretical works, including, of course, uh, Kai Krohn and Blas Kuh, uh, Steve's model, which has been discussed in detail already, and uh, work by uh, Aurelien and uh, co-authors Wolfgang Stefan, and also people around Vitalis and uh, co-authors. Uh, but it seems that the mathematical modeling of seed banks uh, is still incomplete. Uh, so the aim of this talk is uh, to include relatively large seed banks with potentially extended periods of dormancy in a classical Wright Fisher population uh, setup, uh, try to obtain reasonable scaling limits if possible, and investigate ancestral relationships in terms of coalescent processes if possible, uh, in these scaling limits, and also to derive expressions for population genetic quantities uh, to uh, investigate variability under seed banks. Well, let me briefly, I can uh, go through this quickly, um, recall some uh, recent results. So here is the paper by Kai Kron and Lasku. The seed bank effect goes as follows. You have a population of size n, and each individual picks its parent uniformly from a randomly chosen previous generation, say, governed by a random variable b with a law mu, back in time. And then, well, if you support this law mu on finally many generations from 1 to m, independent of the total population size n, then as you rescale the population, uh, let n go to infinity and do the time scaling, measure time in units of generations, uh, you obtain a, obtain a Kingman coalescent, and here uh, the coalescence rates are multiplied by the constant beta squared, which is 1 over the expected yeah, dormancy time or time of inactivity squared. So an increase of the average time that you spend in the seed bank decelerates the coalescent and therefore increases the effective population size. Um, however, as Aurelien has already pointed out, um, the well, relative uh, site or normalized site frequency spectrum is unaffected because the ancestral structure is still governed by Kingman coalescent. It's just a time change, a constant time change over Kingman coalescent, so you cannot see this in the frequency spectrum. And uh, well, so I call this a weak seed bank effect, but this is really a mathematical term, of course. I mean, uh, it is still a very important uh, effect, right? I mean, weak is probably the, the wrong word. Uh, maybe a first order seed bank effect or something like that. Then uh, we thought about the case, what uh, happens if we uh, drop this assumption that uh, well, the dormancy time is small compared to the total population size. Uh, and in the first uh, small paper with uh, Adrian and Noemi and Dario Spano from Boric, uh, well, we investigated this a little bit. We found that we can still get the Kingman coalescent as long as the expected dormancy time is bounded, independent of n. And then we thought, well, what happens if we do something more drastic? Uh, what, how about a heavy tail dormancy distribution with a parameter alpha? And there we had in mind vaguely this picture of these uh, bacteria which can stay I mean, inactive for thousands of years. And then, uh, well, if you do that, then you are either in the regime where you have an expected, finite expected value, which brings you into a Kingman coalescent, or something really bad happens to the genealogy. This is a renewal theory argument, of course. And, uh, if alpha is too small, then, I mean, two sample individuals might not have a common ancestor at all with positive probability. So that is really a degenerate, a degenerate genealogy. And so we spent some time investigating other regimes, but we didn't really find an interesting scaling limit uh, for a while. So we either ended up with a Kingman coalescent or completely degenerate ancestral processes. A problem here is that if you include a long-range seed bank model in the framework of uh, uh, Steve's model, uh, then, of course, you, the model is highly non-Markovian because, I mean, if you can jump many generations in the past and take your type from there, you have to, I mean, carry all the information with you all the time. That's not Markovian. It's not like in the Wright Fisher model where the next generation is just, I mean, determined by the frequencies of the previous generation. So that was an obstacle here. So uh, in this talk, um, we want to investigate a simple Markovian seed bank model, uh, which uh, nevertheless allows uh, extended periods of dormancy, and where the seed bank is comparable in size to the original po population, as in this bacterial data, and where the average dormancy period may be also of order n, scale with n. It's a little bit like classical scaling regimes in population genetics. You scale the mutation rates of order 1 over n and other evolutionary forces, and here we say dormancy time also scales with n, linearly in n. And this leads to a natural new ancestral scaling limit, which we call a, a seed bank coalescent. So what is the model? Um, we consider a haploid population, for simplicity, 
uh, of fixed size n and uh, reproducing in fixed discrete generations, so like the classical Wright Fisher model. Yeah. And we say for simplicity, uh, well, we have only two alleles, uh, type little a and capital A. So we say you know, this is generation k equal to zero, and we have five individuals here. Then further, we assume that there's a seed bank. So here we have n individuals, which consists of m dormant individuals in generation k. And uh, so here we call these guys the plants and these, the seeds, even if we talk about bacteria for simplicity. And then um, we introduce a parameter little epsilon between 0 and 1, uh, which uh, well, will then later be the proportion of individuals which go into the seed bank and vice versa, and uh, introduce also a parameter delta, which is epsilon n divided by m. I should write down here, because I need this later, that epsilon n is equal to delta m, and uh, call this c as well. Now, the dynamics of the model is as follows. So, in generation one, a fraction of one minus epsilon time times n plants will just uh, produce offspring in the normal, usual Wright Fisher way. Say, uh, this is the father of this one, this is also the father of this one, and this is the father of this one. So that is a ordinary Wright Fisher dynamics. Uh, and also, I mean, for those who are not taking the fathers from the previous generation, I mean, they take. Uh, well, they are supposed to be seeds which germinate and take their time type from the seed bank. So that would be the fraction epsilon n here. So we take uniformly sampled seeds from the seed bank, let them germinate, and then these seeds here vanish, vanish in the seed bank. So they vacate the seed bank. And that gives us a full new generation of plants. Now, how do we replace the missing guys in the seed bank? Uh, well, we, we assume that the plants here produce seeds, and um, this can be done, for example, by um, a plant which already produced a living individual in the next generation, to fill these vacant slots. So something like that. Oh, let's go here. And the other individuals just stay in the seed bank and remain inactive. So that is, that is the dynamics of this uh, extended Wright Fisher model with a seed bank. So here's a picture once again. I mean, here this is the father the Wright Fisher in reproduction. Here's uh, seeds germinating and uh, plants going into the seed bank. It goes on like this. And uh, you can put genetic types on this. And here you see that in the active population, due to genetic drift, basically, the capital A type has vanished, but it's still present in the seed bank, and it can be reintroduced in principle. So let's uh, describe this mathematically. <clears throat> let's uh, denote by psi k uh, the type vector in generation k, which is made out of n individuals and just carries the type in the active population, and eta k, k is supposed to be the type vector in the seed bank population. But, uh, now this is a nice uh, Markov model because what happens in the next generation is entirely determined by knowing the state of the active and the uh, dormant population. This is a Markovian model. So we call this the Wright Fisher model with a geometric seed bank component. And now we can try to uh, understand uh, scaling regimes. So let's first understand uh, what is the time that a seed stays in the seed bank. Well, this is IRD geometric with success parameter delta, because each of these individuals here has the probability, well, uh, delta to become active. Uh, see, these are the number of individuals which become active, delta m, if you divide by m. This gives you the delta. We will later let these parameters L, epsilon and delta scale with n, and in particular assume that epsilon is of order 1 over n, c over n in this case, and we also assume that the seed bank is on the same order as the living population, so maybe including some constant here. It will determine the seed bank size. Uh, then the seed bank age distribution is geometric with parameter CK over N. And in particular, the average time that you spend in the dormant state 
is of order n. So it's uh, non-negligible on the macroscopic scale. It's not small. Huh? Okay, then let's uh, look at the frequency chains. So assume that the xk counts the number of little a alleles in generation k, and just count them, and uh, compute the relative frequency here, normalizing by 1 over n, and assume that the y here, oh, doesn't seem to, uh, here counts the number of little a's in the dormant, in the dormant population. These are, the pair is a discrete time Markov chain uh, taking values in these state spaces. And we denote the, the law of them by p x, y. Now, doing this scaling here uh, uh, by a factor of 1 over n leads to an interesting limit. So, for example, if we take suitable test functions and compute the discrete generator of this guy, so the one with the one-step transitions here, then we see that this generator converges as n goes to infinity uh, to the following object here, where you see a migration term, first order derivative, in the x component, and also a migration term here in the y component, with factors c and ck, and here the usual right fisher term uh, determining the uh, genetic drift, so that is the diffusion term uh, in, the, in the generator. And this, of course, holds uniform in x and y. In other words, what you see is that your two rescale frequency processes converge weakly, and they solve a pair of stochastic differential equations uh, where this has the ordinary right fisher term here. And here is a migration term uh, as well as here. But in the seed bank, you don't have the right fisher term. And that is because in the seed bank, you cannot reproduce. And uh, if you don't leave the seed bank, you just copy the type of your parent. So there is no stochasticity in the, in the seed bank. So you turn off the right fisher noise uh, there. And uh, let's think a little bit about this. If the seed band frequency y is bigger than uh, in the original population, then you get an upward drift here from the seed bank of new little a's and vice versa. So that is uh, the diffusion limit of our, our model in this particular scaling regime when epsilon scales with one over it. Yeah. So, and that k doesn't enter the variance because... Uh, no, no, it, uh, it's funny. It only appears here. It's because they evolve on the same time scale, I guess. No, the, 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 so the k is not, is not present in, in this bit here. So most of the guys really have a, a right Fisher reproduction, and only the fraction epsilon n does not, but there the k doesn't enter. So it's really, it's not in the, it's not in the diffusion term. Yeah. Now, of course, when you see this, you ask yourself, what is a dual process? And people with, who have seen many of, of these models uh, can easily guess what, what the dual of this is. Uh, uh, and in general, I just want to point out that uh, dual processes are extremely useful in the analysis of these uh, systems because they give you information about genealogies and also about the forward in time behavior. So here it's easy to read off what the dual does. You can uh, either uh, go into the uh, uh, coalesce, that is, the, oops, right Fisher term here that you know from the Kingman coalescent. You see a coalescence here in the active population at red angels too, and these are just the migration terms. You go from the active population to the seed bank, and vice versa with red C times number of lineages and CK times number of lineages. So that is the dual it's standard to read it off. And it is very useful uh, because, uh, well, it's easy to see that eventually the number of lineages collapses down to one. It can be dominated by a pure death process. And, uh, at the same time, you have this nice moment duality, which is entirely similar to, a, to the right Fisher case. And that allows you to compute the long-term behavior of all these moments in the model. Uh, because uh, well, if you let t go to infinity uh, to compute moments here, that is equivalent to letting n and m go to infinity, but n and m converge to 1. So you end up in the end with just one particle jumping on top of x and y, and that allows you to compute the moments. And this is something I learned from Alison. It's in her Lesouche notes uh, in, a, in a different uh, setup also, uh, in the stepping stone model, I think. So yeah, let's uh, try to investigate the long-term behavior of this system of equations. Well, this is the classical right fisher diffusion without migration here and without mutation. And it's, clear, uh, it's known that uh, when this process gets absorbed at the boundaries, uh, 0 and 1, and even after final time, and, uh, uh, the expected time is also uh, finite. So, but this is not, it's not the case anymore in our two-dimensional system. Uh, 
So there, obviously, 0, 0 and 1, 1 are also absorbing states, but you don't hit the boundaries in finite time. Nevertheless, you can uh, uh, investigate what happens in law, if, if you have convergence in law. And, um, well, this can be done easily by computing the limit of all these uh, moments. Well, you have the duality, which gives you the first equality sign here. And then you have the particles NT and MT, which go down to a situation with only one particle, and then it's trivial to compute that moment. And because you always come down to one particle, all the moments are actually the same. Uh, that's uh, kind of a, a funny. Uh, so uh, you end up with a dif distribution where all the moments are the same, and the only distribution which has this is a Dirac, uh, is a superposition of two Dirac uh, measures in one and in zero. So that is here the absorption probability in law right, that you can derive from this duality. Uh, this is in line with classical results for the right Fischer diffusion. And we can look at a little bit of a, uh, the special cases. As k goes to infinity, that means. Yeah, almost surely you don't get it. Yeah. yeah, but never hits. We will come to that. Yeah, it's, it's true that you don't hit the boundaries. You, I will come to that in a, in a, in a second. Yeah, oh, you, will, you will not. Yeah. Okay, so let for a second assume k goes to infinity. That is, the seed bank becomes small compared to the plant population by my choice of parameters. Well, then the fixation probability just approaches x, yeah, which is the classical fixation probability of the right Fisher model. And let uh, the k become small, when, so that's a situation in which the uh, seed bank is completely overwhelmingly large. Uh, well, then the initial condition or the population frequency in the seed bank completely determines the outcome in the long run. It's uh, kind of nice. But uh, the pathwise, almost sure, the picture is different. Uh, indeed, you will not see absorption in finite time. And the way to understand this is to look at whether the block, down, block counting process comes down from infinity. And in fact, it doesn't. Uh, so there will, in a hypothetical infinite population, always be infinitely many lineages. And that prevents absorption. You can also see that because the second equation is completely deterministic, and you can dominate this, and you get only exponential decay, uh, but you never hit the boundaries. So it really uh, qualitatively alters the, some of the uh, properties of the model, even this little adjustment to the system. Right. OK, so in an infinite population, population uh, uh, variability will never be completely lost. But this is, of course, hypothetical. Now let's uh, take a genealogical point of view. Um, we know already the block counting process, so it's kind of trivial to construct the coalescent process, <coughs> corresponding coalescent process. and. Uh, we can do that as follows. Here is our model. Let's take a sample, three guys here, from the, previous, from the present generation. And let's follow their ancestral lines backward in time. So here you see that one goes into the seed bank, stays there a little bit, then come back, comes back. And here you see the first merging event of two guys. And here, all three are merged. So if you want to write this as partitions, all three will be separated for a long time until you see the first merger of guy number one and number three here. So they're in the same partition block now. And here, everyone is in one block only. But how do we encode this uh, position here? Because, I mean, keep in mind, if you are in the seed bank, you cannot coalesce with another guy. In the seed bank, there is no reproduction. You just copy your types. So there is no coalescence in the second, second component. Uh, so we encode this by switching to marked partitions. And we give each uh, block a little flag here. So for example, here, the P means this guy is currently in the active plant population and allowed to coalesce. This guy is in the active plant population. This one is in the active plant population. But here you switch from P to S. So this lineage goes into the seed bank population. And all the partition blocks with an S will be prevented from coalescing. They are not allowed to coalesce. Right. So here's just a way to make this formal. Here are the partitions with flags, S and P, attached to each block. And here is a typical state. If you have uh, k individuals or k sample of size k, this is a typical state of the seed bank coalescent. These guys coalesced being active. This one not coalesced being in the seed. These uh, coalesced and active. Now, what are the possible transitions? Of course, you can see merging events. And we, know this, we denote this by this little symbol here. But only 
if two blocks merge, which both carry the P flag, because you're only allowed to, to merge in the active population. And then there is another transition, which we indicate by this little bow tie here. And that just tells you that you change the flag from S to P or from P to S. So you will enter the seed bank or you leave the seed bank. These are the only possible transitions which are allowed. And so this gives you the seed bank coalescent. Uh, you have this normal coalescence into a given, of a given pair of blocks at rate one. You have switching from plants to seeds at the rate C and switching from uh, seeds to plants at rate C times K. It's not entirely symmetric here. And if C and K are one, so it means the seed bank size is the same as the total pop normal population size, we call this the standard seed bank coalescent. So here is the guy. It looks pretty much like a Kingman coalescent, but you have these stretches here of dotted lines. Uh, they indicate that you are currently in the seed bank, and uh, dotted lines are not allowed to merge. You can only see mergers of active lines which are completely black. Right? And here at this horizontal line, you see that number one and two have merged, but are actually currently in the seed bank, so they get a seed bank flag here. And the others here, this group has merged and is active. That gives this big block here in the middle. So that is the scaling limit. It appears uh, as the limiting genealogy of this right fisher model with geometric seed bank component, pretty much in the same way as the Kingman coalescent comes in the classical right fisher model. And indeed, we can formalize this, denote the state uh, of an n sample with population size big n in generation minus i backward in time, because we're going backward in time, by this guy uh, using these flags here, indicating whether you're active or not. And then we get this corollary under the assumptions of our, our, under our scaling assumptions, this guy here converges into the seed bank coalescent. Okay, nice. So what are the properties of this guy? Uh, it behaves very differently from a classical Kingman coalescent, and here are two examples. One is the guy does not come down from infinity. What does coming down from infinity mean? Well, this has been introduced by Pittman and Schweinsberg, and coming down from infinity means that the corresponding co block counting process of a coalescent has finitely many blocks immediately after time zero. So it's coming down from infinity immediately. Uh, well, our process doesn't have that. Uh, the seed bank coalescent does not come down from infinity. And in fact, the block counting process stays infinite for all time if you start with infinitely many particles at the beginning. And why is that? Well, if you have an infinite sample, for example, in the plant population, a lot of them escape into the seed bank before coalescing, and you have to control this. You mean even if M0 is 0, uh, if uh, you start with, yes, with M0 is 0, you have Yes, 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 yes. If you start with infinitely many in the seed bank, that's trivial. Yes, yes yeah, yeah. but even if you start there, enough of them vanish into the, into the seed bank. Yeah. And also, you can look at the time to the most recent common ancestor in this model, which here we define as well, the time when the block counting process or seed bank coalescence has only one block given that you start with n guys in the plant population. You can also extend this to a mixed sample from plants and seeds. It's not, not a problem. And here, the time to the most recent common ancestor is therefore this, the first time that you had a configuration with only one guy. Well, then, this is not in expectation bounded as for the Kingman coalescent. For the Kingman coalescent, it's bounded by two even. But instead, it is, uh, well, weakly asymptotically equivalent to log log n. Uh, what do I mean by this symbol? It means that the lim inf of this guy divided by log log n is bigger than zero, and the limb sup of this guy divided by this is smaller than infinity. It's not a completely precise result. We don't have a distributional convergence, but at least it gives you some idea of uh, uh, what is happening. And <laughs> it's surprisingly, it's the same time scale that you see in the bolthausen sittmann coalescent, although this is a completely different model. But bolthausen sittmann also has a uh, time to the most recent common ancestor of order log log n. And uh, here is a picture which explains that. Uh, so you start with many individuals at the beginning, and most of them immediately merge, but a few of them make it into the seed bank. And so they, the blue line here indicates that they're in the seed bank. And roughly, after two time units, everybody in the active population has coalesced. But about log n, many guys have made it into the seed bank. And if you have log n guys in the seed bank, well, uh, it takes you another, it just gives you another log to get them all out of the seed bank and make them coalesce, and that gives you the log log n here. So that's roughly the idea why, why that happens. Of course, it's a very small number, log log n. I mean, it's not, uh, it's, I mean, essentially bounded, but uh, in a mathematical sense, it's not. 
Now you can extend this model. Of course, you can include mutation, like on the order of 1 over n, that gives you Poisson mutations appearing at, uh, say, rate theta 1 on the active lines and theta 2 on the dormant lines. And here, of course, you can discuss whether you should allow uh, mutations in the dormant stage. Perhaps you choose a smaller mutation rate there or mutation rate 0. Uh, this has to be, I mean, uh, discussed with, uh, or it depends on the model that you are looking at. And then also you can include mortality in the seed bank. This is something that uh, Lennon and Jones always uh, assumed. So you can, for example, also kill individuals in the seed bank, say at a death rate d divided by n. And you make up for this by sending more active guys into the seed bank, then that just leads to an effective seed bank parameter, k tilde. So that can be incorporated as well. And uh, there's also a Moran model formulation of this, but I'm not going into this. And we're currently trying to write on the look down construction, which is, well, uh, with a toolbox, of course, simple. And uh, uh, it's a master student whose task it is to write this down, Christian Horvath. Yes, uh, so here is a picture of the seed bank coalescent with mutation. For example, we set theta 2 equal to 0. That means we don't allow mutations on the inactive lines. So you don't see them here, but you have them on the active lines. OK, so uh, let's uh, think a little bit about universality of this model. When do we expect to see such a seed bank coalescent arising from a population model? Well, and I think it is fair to expect this um, we haven't proved it, but uh, it seems to be the case that if the active population, of course, without the seeds, is in the domain of attraction of the Kingman coalescent, and this is very well understood, say with a time scaling n, or more generally 1 over Cn, where Cn is this typical constant, uh, which uh, is the probability that two individuals have the same father in the previous generation in the Kennings model. Uh, then you want the seed bank to be of comparable size as the active population of order n. You may allow some little fluctuations, but the fluctuations have to be of smaller order. Uh, so, for example, you have a constant k between them, as I assumed. And then also, initiation and resuscitation from dormancy have to happen at a rate of, of order 1 over n as well, as do the mutations. It's 1 over n here as well. And if, as soon as you have that, you should expect a seed bank coalescent to appear with suitable parameters. It's a different scaling than the scaling that Aurelien uh, presented, and uh, that was also assumed in uh, the paper by by Steve Crone and co-authors. Uh, I would also like to point out there, is, uh, there are relations to other models. Namely, you can rewrite the seed bank diffusion as a stochastic delay differential equation. That's quite interesting. I'm not going into the details, but of course, you <laughs> taking a seed bank from, from the past, is, uh, like it's, it introduces a delay. And um, the delay exhibits an exponential decay that has to do with the geometric time that you spend in the seed bank. So it's uh, kind of nice. Uh, and uh, I don't have, it's interesting, but I don't have time to go into it, unfortunately. And it's, of course, also related to the two island model uh, and the structured coalescent. But for the structured coalescent, you allow coalescences in both islands. And that makes, of course, uh, the time to the most recent coalescence is the finite, and, and uh, you come down from infinity. But completely blocking it in one island really changes, changes the situation. So it's not easy to get one model out of the other. They're not, in the qualitative properties, they're not, uh, not similar. And the question here is, what is a stationary distribution, for example? Is it like a mixture over beta distributions with an exponential decay, something, decay, something like that? We're trying to discuss this with Eugenio, another PhD student of mine, uh, Adrian and Alison, and, but this is in an early stage of, uh, of discussion. Now, let's come back to the microbial populations. Now, we have this limiting object. Let's see what the modeling assumptions of the biologists were. So, Lennon and Jones, also, Jones and Lennon in a previous paper came up with this picture where you have active cells which reproduce and dormant cells. Both can die and uh, you can enter the seed bank and leave it. And microbes, they can switch, I mean, uh, basically several times after. Uh, I mean, it's not like a seed that germinates and then never can go back into this uh, dormant state. But uh, cells, really, they seem to be in a sort of equilibrium between uh, dormant and active uh, populations. And then the rates here would uh, correspond to our rate C and the rate CK in, the, in, our, in our model. Now, when you have a coalescent structure, that usually allows you to compute all kinds of uh, population genetic quantities in your model. So it's extremely useful. And you can, in principle, try to do everything that you can do for the Kingman coalescent as well. 
So for example, we can investigate three quantities. We have already looked a little bit at the time to the most recent common ancestor, but then can also try to compute the total tree length and the external branch length and internal branches and so on and so on, rescale it, try to find distributional limits. And then these uh, quantities usually translate into population genetic quantities, such as the number of segregating sites and the infinite sites model, of course. This is the total tree length, I mean, the number of rotations that you find. Uh, and, uh, well, pairwise differences, singletons, the side frequency spectrum, and so on. Uh, also, sampling formulas can be attacked, at least by recursions, but the recursions are a bit more nasty than in the Kingman coalescent because you can switch infinitely often in principle between the, vacant, uh, the dormant and the active state, and which is not the case in the Kingman coalescent. So, searching for explicit distributions here poses some interesting mathematical questions. But let's uh, look at the time to the most recent common ancestor again in a little bit more detail. Well, we have this abstract mathematical result, it's of order log log n. But of course, in practice, it doesn't help you and you don't know when it kicks in and typically sample sizes are small. So uh, what happens to the time to the most recent common ancestor? Uh, well, let's derive a recursion called t little t n comma m, the expected time to the most recent common ancestor. If you start with sample of size n in the plants and m in the dormant population, then uh, let's also abbreviate by lambda and m, where the total rate at which something happens in the coalescent. This is the rate at which you see, or the actual probability at which you see uh, uh, coalescence if something happens. This is the probability of seeing uh, a guy going into the seed if something happens, and this is the probability of a guy coming back from the seed if something happens, and then you can condition on the first transition event backward in time, and that gives you this recursion for the expected time to the most recent common ancestor. First, you wait for something to happen. Well, the rate for something to happen is exponential with rate lambda n comma n, so the expected value is one over this. And then with probability alpha n m, you see a coalescence with probability beta n m, the guy goes into the seed bank, and so on. So that's a simple recursion that you can write down. And for example, uh, in for sample size two, uh, it's easy to solve this, and you get this formula, which surprisingly is independent of C, but we have seen this already in the absorption probabilities, they were also independent of C. It's uh, quite funny, and uh, well, in particular, this does not converge uh, to, this, uh, to one uh, as C goes to, goes to zero. So you would think if you block the migration between the two populations, that C go to zero, you should recover a Kingman coalescent, but it's not the case. And in fact, this is very similar to what happens in the uh, step, uh, to, to island model. Um, this has been pointed out in a paper by uh, Nath and Griffiths, uh, where also, if the migration rate becomes small, you don't recover the Kingman coalescent situation. There you have a factor of two. Here, if k is equal to one, let's say the seed bank is of equal size as the original population, this gives you four. It's, uh, uh, it's a factor of four. And we will understand why that is. Uh, well, if you scale k, if you let k go to infinity, then you get a Kingman coalescent back. Um, here are a few pictures. So let's say k is equal to 1. That means seed bank is as big as population size, active population. Then we get, for a sample of size 2, time to the most recent common ancestor, constant equal to 4, independent of what c does, and highly elevated for larger sample sizes. If k is equal to 100, that means the seed bank is very small. The seed bank size, relative seed bank size scales with 1 over k. Then you already come very close to the Kingman uh, situation, and Kingman is k equal to infinity. So there you have convergence to the Kingman coalescent, but you don't have it in C. Uh, yeah, and of course, the reason is, maybe we should, uh, I should point it out, the reason is, of course, uh, simple. I mean, so in, in order for two lineages to coalesce, they have to be in the plant population, right? Now, if C is, for example, very big, close to infinity, you switch all the time between plants and seeds, so you roughly spend only one-fourth of the time in a state where both lineages are in the active population and therefore can coalesce, so that explains the factor of four, the delay of, of four uh, compared to the classical Kingman coalescent. Yeah, then, of course, um, Aurelia has pointed out that uh, at least if you have fixed uh, population size, no demographic history, then the side frequency spectrum is unaffected by a seed bank effect if the seed bank effect is such that you still are in the domain of attraction of the Kingman coalescent just with a constant time change. 
But what happens to the frequency spectrum in the presence of a seed bank uh, with uh, an extended period of dormancy? Well, here is a side frequency spectrum. And so here the black bar here is uh, the normalized side frequency spectrum, I should say, is for the Kingman coalescent. And let's say k is equal to 0.1. That means the seed bank is 10 times bigger as the normal population, then the number of singletons is basically reduced by one half. So there is signal in the side frequency spectrum. Not a terribly strong one, because if the seed bank is of the same order, well, the decrease is not so big, but you can, in principle, detect it. And then, of course, the question is, what are the good statistics to I mean, detect seed banks and the strengths of seed banks and, and maybe measure or estimate the rate with which you switch between the two? Uh, things and that is difficult because in some of the statistics that I've shown you, the C doesn't play a big role, unfortunately. So one really has to. Uh, uh, well, it could also be good, uh, good news, but uh, it's not quite clear to me what whether I should be happy about this or not. Then uh, you can also look at uh, Tajima's D. Can you, I mean, detect these uh, big seed banks with Tajima's D? Here's a simulation. So here's a distribution of the values of Tajima's D around zero for the Kingman coalescent. And here is one where the switching rate is 1, and the seed bank is 10 times the size of the active population. So you see it goes into the positive area, but actually it spreads out a lot. So the variance is, is, is I mean, here, of this is, I mean, yeah, it's, this is really a spread out distribution. So you can have very high values, but also very, very low values. And that also depends on whether you allow mutation in the seed bank or not. I mean, this is uh, complicated. Uh, so you. Well, the tendency towards a positive Tajima D can be understood, of course, because this is a little bit like balancing selection where you preserve old, old variation. And uh, the seed bank also preserves old variation, if you want. But the signal is not very clear. So one also has to uh, maybe investigate this. <laughs> then this opens, of course, a lot of questions. I mean, you can investigate the tree properties. You can try to find stationary distributions. You can try to include other evolutionary forces, such as selection. and in particular fluctuating population size would be important. You can try to see what happens if you, well, here we assume spontaneous switching, but you can also trigger switches, massive switches, that alters the model. You can try to derive the universal limit theorem, the look-down construction. You should try to get statistical tests to detect the presence of a weak versus a strong seed bank. So are we in the regime of Aurelien and Steve, or are we maybe in this regime? Does it depend on the species? How do you estimate parameters? How can you simulate? And so on and so on. And of course, uh, we, I'm trying to get contact with Lennon and Jones, but Lennon is uh, on a field trip in Vietnam collecting bacteria from a cave. <laughs> but I hope to get some, uh, some collaboration with them. And then, uh, yeah. So here are two papers on which uh, both the results are based. Uh, they're both to appear, but can be downloaded from the archive. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jochen. It's uh, just a, a comment. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, two models, and, uh, and so I wanted to point out a third model, where you, uh, in the context of speciation, mm -hmm. imagine that you have so, uh, a big mother population that sends out propagules, which found new colonies, mm -hmm. that these colonies can die out, but they, are small, they have a small size uh, with respect to the, to the mother population. Mm -hmm. And so they, they can split, they split from the main population and then merge again. And so Chun Hoama has studied this model, and he, he uh, well, we obtained uh, exactly the same limit. And since oh, in the okay. context of uh, peripatric speciation, we call that the peripatric coalescent. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry. I was not aware of this. So, <laughs> so it's, also, it's also to appear this year. Yeah. But uh, we, are, we, are, we, are not, uh, uh, we are not heading to the same direction, because we, are, we really want to, to, to embed this black box into the, into the context of speciation and try to... Uh, give prediction in terms of, uh, of uh, coalescence inside the, the phylogenetic tree, which, which would be uh, generated by this kind of model. So I would be very grateful if you could send me the reference. So <clears throat> if you would take a two-island model and a structured coalescent in those, 
and let uh, um, effective population size in one of those tend to infinity, or in other words, uh, coalescence rate uh, tend to zero, which of your functionals would be typically discontinuous and which would be continuous? Well, we have seen already that the time to the most recent common ancestor is discontinuous and jumps uh, at the point where the noise vanishes is in, in one colony. Mm. But for instance, side frequency spectrum and things like that might still... It's not so easy to say. Um, so that is kind of a, a third scaling regime. So I have been looking at varying the C and varying the K but you are kind of uh, trying to vary the uh, diffusion parameter in yes. front of the, second, uh, of the second noise term. I have not investigated this, mm. so mm. I only know it for the time to the most recent common ancestor. But because that jumps, it probably also affects other, other quantities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in terms of flexibility or availability of different modeling assumptions that you mentioned, uh, microbial dormancy provides a really nice class of examples. So for example, in, in uh, biofilms, bacterial biofilms, uh, the, the dormant cells, which tend to be the majority of the cells in a lot of cases, uh, they do mutate. Mm -hmm. So you collect, you get a collection of, of mutations. Basically, you have genetic drift going on, no selection. Um, also, the in experimental biofilms, uh, the the uh, the different phases can be episodic. So you might you might take a biofilm and grow it for a while, and then resuspend the cells and start another biofilm. And so that can even lead to in your N and M there those population sizes would change over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lots of possibilities there. So do you think there's a chance to get information about this switching rate between the two states? Yes. That would be yeah. extremely there's, interesting. There's, there's some mean, things uh, known about that, yeah. And also the age structure, of course. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank uh, Jochen again and all of this morning's speakers.